Hello, I'm Howie Sheriff, and welcome to another You Call This Yoga Internet TV show, where we have discussions with leaders in accessible yoga. Today, we are so fortunate to have a local leader in yoga for athletes, Sage Roundtree. Sage is based in Carborough, which is a I won't say a suburb, I'll say it's a town adjacent to Chapel Hill, where Sage has been a co-owner of Carborough Yoga Company, as well as other ventures in bringing accessible yoga to athletes as well as the everyday person. One may consider themselves athletic, and I used to feel that way about myself too, till I've had my neck fusions and hip replacement. And I approach the world in a recreational and athletic way. So even though I have my limitations, I still am approaching life with vigor and do utilize my yoga practice to help facilitate that. For many, I started out thinking that yoga was going to be an accessory to my athletic endeavors. I called it cross-training, thinking more of the physical and less of the mental. Over time, and due to my injuries, I've come to appreciate yoga as a mental and emotional practice, and as the recreational part has diminished, the mental, physical, and spiritual have blended into a different proportion. Let's also take a moment to thank the people that have been able to tune in at 9.30, uh, we appreciate you keeping that in mind. We're going to do 9.30 next week also. And trying not to be too confusing, we're going to be off the air in two weeks on April 4th. But that doesn't mean to skip next week. It's just for one week. Let's introduce Sage and have her share some of her background and how she became exposed to and interested in yoga. Good morning, Sage. Good morning, Howie. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. How, uh, how did you first get introduced to yoga? <laughs> I took yoga at the gym in 1998. I was looking through the glass into the aerobics room, and I thought, oh, that looks kind of fun and easy. I'm flexible. And I went in there and was completely humbled. <laughs> I found it a very humbling experience. Uh, long holds of standing postures, Sanskrit, um, manual adjustments, and... Um, this kind of mystique around the whole thing that was a little terrifying to me. And I had such a strong reaction to it that I actually went back the next week saying, I gotta figure this out. And the next week there was partner yoga and that was it for me. I was completely turned off and I didn't go back to classes for several years until I was pregnant with my daughter who's now 16 and went to prenatal yoga. Um, with one of my friends who was also pregnant. And it, before the teacher even came in, it was a very sweet experience. Um, there was a big sense of community and connection before the actual class even started. And that's the, that's the class that really changed um, my thinking about yoga. And ironically, the teacher for that class was the same teacher who had, have a, who had, had us do partner yoga in my second class. Mm. And she had us touch each other, rub each other's feet. I thought it was the best thing ever. <laughs> So what changed was me. It wasn't the practice. I was just ready to be receptive. Yes, that timing and readiness. And mm -hmm. even the concept that your first exposure wasn't necessarily a gripping experience. Uh, what kind of athletic endeavors were you doing when you first got exposed to yoga? That when I first started, I was really just enjoying everything at the gym. So all of those group exercise classes, step aerobics, slide aerobics, spin. Um, but between that and, uh, 
and my pregnancy, I got more into running. And then after my pregnancy, I got deeply into running and in training for a marathon when Lily was little, uh, I went to yoga classes that I found to be a huge compliment uh, in really wonderful ways to the running training I was doing, training for a marathon. And in the race itself, I found that the yoga practice was really um, critical to getting me through. And it wasn't that I was busting out a downward facing dog at mile 18 or anything. <laughs> it was that I could stay focused as things got progressively more intense, uh, particularly focused on my breath and my form. And that was a light bulb moment for me to see, oh, it, it really isn't about the poses. It's about the awareness and the attention and um, the focus and presence. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it, it is an epiphany when it's not about powering through, but almost creating a carburetor with a smoother blend of oxygen and fuel. Yep. So I can appreciate that. Uh, in terms of the... Uh, training for the distance running. Did your coach have any familiarity with yoga or is this your own endeavor? It was my own endeavor. And in fact, when I became coached, then I would introduce my coaches to yoga and uh, they always received it really well. So it was, uh, it was just something that I liked both for myself and for the, um, the, in, the interpersonal connection. Uh, of being in a group class was was really sweet as well. Another way to um, kind of feel like you're on a team with the other people in your class. Mm -hmm. And in a team, there's all skill levels. It's it's very unusual unless at an ultimate level where there's that sense of parity. Uh, one has to look potentially at their ego mm -hmm. and see if that is compromising their performance. Uh, because emotions can influence gamesmanship or gameswomanship, as it, it may be. Absolutely. That's an issue I see a lot in um, the classes for athletes that I teach. Is <laughs> we uh, are designed to be competitive, and yoga is not a competition. There's not a finish line. There's not a scoreboard. Uh, so we need to um, take a different mentality when we come onto the yoga mat. Mm -hmm. And how did your exposure to running and your zeal when you were running uh, be affected by becoming more advanced in your yoga training? Did, did anything change in how you approached your races? I grew more familiar with the process of self-talk that happens over the course, particularly of those really long races, so that when negative thoughts emerged or when things grew increasingly difficult, I could recognize that that was, um, that was momentary and that that would pass. And it's almost the meditation practice that teaches that even more directly than the asana practice. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. Uh, so for listeners, please consider that this is not just a show for athletes. Uh, life is an endurance effort in itself. And athleticism is, in a sense, a metaphor or some parallel to what we're doing every day. Mm -hmm. uh, we're always or tending to compare ourselves to others, being critical, when the potential exists that things are really okay as they are. So, Sage, if someone has an injury or if they have physical limitations, how would you invite them to start their grounding and and their positioning just in everyday life? It doesn't have to be a yoga practice. Well, it depends where the injury is. If the injury is in the lower body, then that's going to be a different um, sense of awareness because that grounding and positioning may be in a sitting position. But either way, we need to find the right balance of downward and upward moving energy, uh, energies of, um, of stira and sukha, as we would say in yoga. So of stability, but then also of sweetness and ease. Mm. Oh, wonderful. So it also then infers a sense of self-study even before uh, the yoga gets moving, per se. It's about finding what we have to focus on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I deal a lot with injuries in my class because 
for many athletes, it's the injury that keeps them from doing their workout and gives them the time and the impetus to actually come and give yoga a try. So mm -hmm. it's, it's not unfamiliar to me at all. And my usual spiel about injury is this. All of our athletic injuries are the result of some kind of imbalance, either an imbalance of the body in space, um, you're running on the trail and you lose your balance, you fall, you sprain your ankle or you whack your kneecap, um, or more usually some kind of imbalance within the body. And that's what leads to the inflammatory injuries like um, plantar fasciitis or hip bursitis or patellar tendonitis. All those inflammatory injuries, overuse injuries, we'd call them, are the result of some kind of imbalance within the body. And usually it's either a top to bottom imbalance, upper body, lower body strength, or hip, lower leg strength, a front to back imbalance, strong abs, overstretched back, like you might see on a cyclist, or a left right imbalance. And you can see how team sports, sports with a ball or sports with a ball and a stick, uh, where the leverage changes even more, can incur a right left imbalance. And the yoga poses give us an opportunity to first see where those imbalances are and then to correct them. And when we can get the body in better balance, which of course is always a moving target, then we can avoid injuries that might be waiting for us down the road without care. Mm. Very clear that we all live in an imbalanced positioning because we might use one arm more strongly than another. Yep. We may lean a certain way due to injury. Uh, I know I've seen scores of mothers carrying their child on a hip. I used to carry my son on my shoulders. <laughs> uh, that was part of what I would call crowd control or uh, just keeping a rein on the little guy. Uh, but I had to compensate for that, too. And I know that I had to do that for a long time by choice and not necessarily out of clarity of what I was doing other than mm -hmm. crowd control. So uh, many of our daily activities will um, develop a pattern of imbalance, like consider driving. Uh, particularly now that we don't usually drive with both feet in an automatic car, we're just using one foot and often leaning the other knee up against the, the door. So right there, you've got this strange imbalance between the two sides. Or sitting at your desk, resting on your left arm and clicking around with your mouse with your right hand will lead to an imbalance left to right. Mm. So viewers and listeners, we're going to invite you to A, check yourself out. See if you can draw the feet down, push the tush back, extend the crown upward, let the shoulders relax, take your hands off your mice, or if you have more than one mouse, and <laughs> consider that you can call in at 919-518-9773, ask the expert, and I don't mean me, or you can Skype in at Computers 2K Voice, you can also join the chat on the Nissan Communications page where you log in and send us a message. So as you're doing that, we're going to prepare for our first Pearl of Wisdom, which Sage will give some insights into getting ready to practice. You may have heard of the ujjayi breath described like an ocean sound in the back of your throat. I'd like to use another ocean metaphor to show you a way to downregulate your nervous system. It's thinking of the breath like a wave moving over your body. So feel your inhalation come in like an oncoming wave and transition to an exhalation that lasts a little bit longer than the inhalation. That means you'll feel like the tide is going out, the breath comes in, and when it goes out, it takes a little bit longer to go out. Inhalation, long, slow, and gentle. Exhalation, longer, slower, more complete. You can feel the beach growing in front of you as the tide continues to go out. Longer exhalations and longer exhalations. Once you're comfortable with the length of the exhalation, can spend a moment lingering in the transition between the breath coming in and the breath going out. Same thing happens at the other end of the breath. There's a pause before the next breath comes in. Don't force these. Keep them very natural and comfortable. After several rounds of this, release your breath to do what it would like. 
Notice the effects on your nervous system. Hopefully it's helped you feel more grounded, centered, and calm. Mmm, viewers, are you still awake? Good. <laughs> you know, a breathing practice is an integral part for me when I was being more aerobic. And it wasn't until many years into the process for me that I was focusing on the breath, maybe because breathing was more challenging for me. Uh, the breathing that Sage just mentioned for me is a bit of a calming and grounding breath, and we'll explore that a little bit more. Sage, how do you encourage folks to develop the breathing at different phases of their activities, whether it be resting, warming up, competing, cooling down? What, how's your philosophy? Great question. I want athletes and everyone to find the right breath for now, the right breath for whatever is happening in whatever moment is now. And if that's just sitting around watching this show, it's not a Nujayi breath, it's not a Kapalabhati bellows breath, it's just a relaxed breath. But the breath will change depending on the demand on your system. So when you're warming up, your breath should become more rhythmic and begin to key to your movements. And in your harder efforts, it becomes um, a really important tool to support your effort. So I ask athletes to consider how their breath coordinates with their movement at various paces, at their warm-up pace, at their 10K pace, at um, their 100-meter pace, and to see what the baseline is so that if things go off the rails, they have a target to head back toward. Mm. Uh, for runners, this might mean asking, how many steps are you taking on an inhalation? How many steps are you taking on an exhalation? And which foot is hitting the ground when you start to breathe in? Which foot is hitting the ground when you start to breathe out? I've asked this to countless groups of athletes, and often they just kind of scratch their heads and they don't know the answer to that question. There's usually one or two ringers. And if you have swimmers, they had better know the answer to that. Yeah. <laughs> they're dealing with the water environment. But a lot of folks don't know, and it would be the easiest thing to collect data on in your next run. So I invite them to start to notice what the pattern is so that if things start to feel especially difficult or the breath gets hung up or out of control, they have a target to aim for. Mm. As you were citing that, I was picturing some of my history of exercise and how I've tried to use the breath because I haven't been particularly strong due to some of these injuries or neuromuscular changes from arthritis. Uh, viewers, for me, I've come to find whether I'm on an elliptical machine, on the road, though that's more historic than current, or even working with weights, that there's a certain breathing pattern that I like to incorporate where I'm really emphasizing the exhale to prolong it and purge out any stale air. I'm not using massive amounts of weights and I'm not running at a tremendous pace. So therefore that the burn is kind of steady and even, it'll go up and down a little bit. So for teachers, the thing to consider is how are you cueing the breathing when you're picking up the pace for your class? or lowering it. And for viewers who are participants, are you even thinking about that? And can you experiment with that when not in class? Because class is a whole different set of conditions. So Sage, when you were running, and are you still a runner? I am. Are there other uh, athletic endeavors that you participate in? I've been able to run <laughs> with only a recurrent ankle injury for the last few years. Um, so since the running is going well, I've abandoned um, the swim and bike that I would do in triathlon training. Uh, it makes a wonderful cross training, but the running has been going well. So that's my main activity. Hmm. And what is your uh, maintenance breath when you're running? Let's compare. How do you, uh, how do you like to breathe when you're in stride? Well, it depends what pace I'm going, mm -hmm. um, but generally I'm taking three or four steps on an inhalation and three or four steps on an exhalation. And sometimes I'll play with that. If you 
choose an odd number of steps on one half of the breath, obviously, then it's going to affect which foot is hitting the ground when the breath starts and to come in and when it starts to go out. And with that odd ratio, having some threes in there, that means that your diaphragm will be in a different position when your feet hit the ground. And that's a nice way to avoid the side stitch is to, mm. to keep things shifting. Um, but happily, I have a wonderful group of women that I run with and often I'm chatting the whole time. <laughs> so I don't have to focus quite so much on uh, exactly how things are coordinating. I'm just enjoying being in the woods with my friends. Mm. Well, that's, that's an interesting contrast. Uh, for me, I find that I have to focus strongly on my breathing uh, and maybe because it's also some of my mobility challenges or postural challenges, uh, I'm very focused on my alignment, which doesn't make me the most social of partners <laughs> now walking in the neighborhood. Uh, so viewers and listeners, there is a range of options as to how to breathe. Sage talks about an even breathing. And for me, maybe because I'm a dense high BMI kind of fellow who breathes possibly deeper and more strongly, I breathe in slowly and I give a very continuous pronounced exhale. And this might be okay for me, but not necessarily for everyone else. So I'll take a breath in and I'll exhale slowly three times. It's almost as the similar way that Sage was talking about grounding, I'm doing, I'm doing longer exhales to try to calm myself down while I'm exerting. It's almost a mixed message to my nervous system. But that way, for me, I feel that I'm purging carbon dioxide more effectively than just trying to circulate that. Sage, feel free to be critical. How does that sound? Uh, Howie, <laughs> if, it, if it feels like the right breath for you now, then I'm happy. I, do, I would just... I really think that there's some intuitive wisdom in your body and that you will figure it out pretty quickly. Thank you. <laughs> well, fortunately, I'm not running as much as I used to, uh, so I don't have to dwell on that. But even on an elliptical machine, uh, viewers and listeners, think about your posture, not only now, but when you're in movement. Even if you're confined to a wheelchair, there is movements that you could be doing that could balance your body out and improve your breathing. So since I brought up a chair, Sage, how do you encourage athletes to sit? Does that ever come up in the conversation? I can't say that it has, although if my athletes find themselves sitting a lot, I encourage them to um, continually be shifting. If they can get up um, and take a walk every, uh, every hour or so, that's obviously really useful. Mm -hmm. um, and if they are sitting, I don't want them completely slumped into the, the forward flexion that we find ourselves in on the bike, for example, because if you, that's how you spend your eight hour work day, and then you go and spend another two hours in that position, obviously we're accruing, um, even more of this pattern of imbalance front to back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for your athletes, how critical is mountain pose in their perspectives? Very, and uh, we wind up doing that in every class with awareness um, because it's not just the breath that's important, it's the form. And sometimes I use this as a, an entry point to teach the Yoga Sutras in class that this is the base of the practice is first we have yama and niyama, but then we have form and breath. And the form just needs to be uh, as efficient as it can be with the right balance of uh, stability and mobility, the right balance of strength and flexibility. Mountain pose is really good to memorize and come back to uh, over the course of whatever athletic endeavor folks are participating in, because that's the basis of a, a good anatomical alignment and therefore will be more efficient. Mm -hmm. When you're doing endurance sports, efficiency is the name of the game. You want to have as much economy as you can so that the energy is freer for longer. Mm hmm. Fully agreed. Uh, for some of my travels, and lately that includes journeying into music and learning a string instrument, mandolin, uh, I've come to find that I focus very intensely on the physical part, which is moving fingers, essentially. And I can find that it is easy to 
lose focus on breathing. Uh, and even standing or sitting and playing an instrument is an endurance activity. Uh, there's a lot of focus, but it could also be a very static activity at the same time. So the breath is very important. So viewers and listeners, it's not just about athletics. It could be anything throughout your day that involves positioning, some movements or minimal, and breathing, focusing on mountain. So when we're building mountain, uh, the feet are an integral part of that. How do you suggest, Sage, that people develop a yoga practice for their feet? I like people in, in terms of mountain pose to think about where your feet would be landing in your activity. So if you're running, you're not running with your feet on a straight line like a supermodel walking down the catway. You're running with your feet about a nat at a natural hip distance. And if you're riding a bike with your feet locked into the pedals, it's slightly wider perhaps um, than where your feet would be landing when you're running. So I like, I like to give folks an opportunity to consider how their feet are planted or think about a tennis player, maybe a slightly wider stance there as they're ready to receive the ball, to receive a serve. Um, so I have the athletes think about what the practice is and work from the ground up with their feet there. Mm -hmm. I also like, though, um, more specifically about the feet to get people out of their shoes and into moving their feet um, in various ways, into spreading their toes and scrunching their toes, into pointing and flexing, or pointing and keeping the, um, the foot extended but peeling back just the toes, or playing with the toes, mm -hmm. uh, going through like you were playing scales on the piano with the toes. These can be very frustrating exercises yeah. for, for, for people who haven't been asked to do them. But pretty quickly, the foot will come along um, and you start to build the neuromuscular connections and learn how to access the muscles that are already there and are already strong enough. You just haven't um, played with asking the brain to get them to fire. Um, so we do a decent amount of that in my classes. And that's a good way to build better strength in the foot so you can ward off some issues like plantar fasciitis. Hmm. I've been to classes where we've used a ball, a small ball, to help stimulate the bottom of the foot and other limbs and parts of the body. But since we're talking about feet, I've seen different types of balls. What do you like to use for bottom of the foot care? What kind of ball, if any, do you use? A tennis ball is, is a, a good choice because it's softer. It's softer than a lacrosse ball. It's definitely softer than a golf ball, although some people really love to just rail on themselves <laughs> with those golf balls. I think uh, generally softer is better. I also think your own hand is really useful to give yourself a foot massage and notice if there are tight spots and interlace your, your fingers and your toes, get a spread between your toes. So it doesn't even require... Uh, any equipment, but a tennis ball is cheap and soft. And, and for me, it would be the preferred choice. Mm, beautiful. Well, viewers and listeners, consider if you'd like to check in and ask the expert. In the meantime, we're going to be preparing for our Neomon sponsor spot. But first, I'd like to direct you to consider the Neomon website. It's neomon.com because they have a special section for the recipes that they've been sharing. If you look on the Neomond website, neomond.com, and look under Explore, you can back view other recipes that they've shared for us. So let's prepare to view the Neomond Minute and enjoy. Hi, I'm Betty Sali with Neomond. I'm in the Neomond kitchen today, and we're going to talk about the eggplant fetti, a traditional Lebanese dish made with eggplant, yogurt, chickpeas, pine nuts, tahini, olive oil, and a lot of other good things. When you make the chickpea fetti, you'll notice that it's not only delicious, but very healthy for you. We wanted to share with you also the health benefits of eating Greek style or Lebanese style yogurt. They're the same. Greek yogurt can have twice as much protein as regular yogurt. The extra protein will help you feel full and leave you feeling satisfied. If you're watching your carbs or have a sensitivity to carbs, then Greek yogurt is your ticket. Regular yogurts have 15 to 17 grams of carbs per cup, where Greek yogurt averages around nine grams. 
and it's also easy to digest because it has less lactose, the sugar and dairy products that can sometimes upset people's stomachs. By the way, fatti means crumbled bread in Arabic and it's normally used with this dish. But, you know, a lot of people are watching their carbs, so we opted not to include it in this recipe. But please feel free to do so if you like. For the full recipe, go to our website, neomond.com. And thank you for watching the Neomond Minute. And when you go to the Neomond site, look for the header called Explore, and then when you click on that, you'll find this and other delicious recipes that are available at Neomon. Thank you, Neomon, for sponsoring our show for several months. We look forward to your sharing of delicious, fun and yum, good health tips, and for folks to come to your locations in Morrisville and Raleigh. All right. Well, I'm getting hungry, too. So <laughs> that made me I'm, hungry. <laughs> so we better get back to talking so we can at least <laughs> fill the bill. Uh, viewers and listeners, I'd like to remind you that you can call in and check in with Sage or myself. Uh, the phone number is 919-518-9773 and Skype Computers 2K Voice or the chat room where you log in. Uh, we also would like to reiterate that next week our show is at 930 and then the following week we have a week off. Amnon, um, our producer, has some personal needs, and the show doesn't go on without him. It might go on without me, but we definitely need Amnon. So we look forward to 9.30 next week to start. April 4th, no show. Returning April 11th with the renowned David Emerson, who has done lots of research in trauma-sensitive yoga. However, we get to return to SAGE. Thank you, Sage. Uh, tell us about some of your activities with Carbro Yoga Company and some of the programs that athletes in the general community may benefit by because your website is chock full of good things. We have a wonderful teaching staff. Uh, it's a sister, uh, a network of three sister studios. We have Carbro Yoga, Durham Yoga, and Hillsboro Yoga. Um, and together we call them Carolina Yoga Company. Uh, we have a teacher training at the 200 hour level and the 500 hour level based primarily in Carborough with some, um, some of the workshops for the 500 hour offered in Durham and Hillsborough. I teach a five day on teaching yoga to athletes for teachers who are generally already teaching at the 200 hour level, also for coaches and athletic trainers, personal trainers uh, every summer here in Carborough and around the country as well at Kripalu Center uh, for Yoga and Health in Western Massachusetts in January at the 1440 Multiversity, which is a new facility opening in Santa Cruz County. Um, in June, I'll be there in June. And I also have it online at sageyogateachertraining.com. We have weekly classes on yoga for athletes. My Monday night class is at six o'clock in Carborough, and that really is for all ages, all levels. We also have a yoga for young athletes class that my student Leslie teaches. That's generally for ages about 11 to 17 or so. Um, those are the kids who play year round sports and specialize really early. So they get to um, spend time with their peers folks in their age range and move through a, a fun practice that will help them find balance. We have a class that's called Yoga for Healthy Aging, but used to be called Yoga for Aging Athletes, which of course is all of us, even the young athletes are aging athletes. Mm -hmm. uh, that comes on Mondays at three o'clock and those are all, all in Carborough. We also have a Yoga for Tennis uh, on Thursdays in Carborough. And then in Durham, our studio manager, Yenny, teaches uh, myofascial release throughout the month of April. And that starts on April 1st and goes for four weeks, 1230 on Saturdays. And that would be really useful for not just athletes, but anyone who feels their body is tight in particular spots and wants to have some tools um, for releasing adhesions and getting rid of um, pathological tightness. Because of course, some of that tightness is just the result of using your body. And some of that tightness is useful for your sport. You need to have a certain amount of stiffness and stability in order to generate power in your sports. You wouldn't wanna just be a wet noodle loosey goosey, but you don't wanna get so stiff and so tight that you can't release. Hmm, interesting. So as you were going through some of the courses and classes, uh, what comes to mind is a question of 
is there a difference in teacher philosophy and also the mindset of youth athletes, 20s and 30s, 40s and 50s, and then we'll say the uh, more mature athletic crowd, 60 plus. Uh, what, what might you suggest for teachers and also for the participants to keep in mind about their anatomy and physiology? Um, the younger bodies are still developing, and sometimes they are growing in, by leaps and bounds. I think of um, basketball players who can grow several inches over the course of a school year. I mean, sometimes more than several inches over a course of a school year. Uh, and the soft tissues might uh, not be able to adapt to the degree that the bones are growing so quickly. Uh, so we're not trying to... Um, force those bodies into any particular flexibility. We're just trying to help them find better balance, tools for self-regulation, um, tools for staying focused before and during competitions. Uh, so it's not so much about the physical, it's more about the mental, as we, as we already said, mm -hmm. toward the top of the hour. Um, for the, the mid-range athletes um, for my regular class, uh, the thing I usually say at the start of class is that it's not athletic yoga. It's a yoga class for people who are getting their workout somewhere else. And I know a lot of people do come to yoga for a workout. And if they found themselves in my yoga to athletes class, they'd be somewhat disappointed because we keep things quite mellow. Uh, the more serious an athlete is in training and competition, the more focused their training program is going to be to get them sports specific strengths. So they're working out with the trainer they're working out with a the coach, they're working out with a the team. They don't need for yoga to pile on more stress. Instead, that yoga class is to help them with balance. Mm. And our aging, our class for the aging population is more about ways to keep healthy and balanced as we age. We spend less time um, moving up and down, not that we move up and down very much in any of uh, my classes because they're not vinyasa classes, they're not flow classes, the yoga for athletes classes. Uh, more static. We move some, but we don't spend a whole lot of time with postural shifts and even less in the classes for aging athletes. Mm. So what's what's very uh, interesting to me is this is the kind of yoga that you call this yoga shares, which I jokingly call the lay around look like you're doing nothing yoga. That's the best kind. <laughs> And then, Absolutely. <laughs> and then I learned that, oh, that's sort of like what yin yoga is. And, yeah. and then, oh, I've been using all these other things. Oh, that's what adaptive yoga is. Uh, yep. So athletes, uh, your bodies may be disparate left and right, front and back, up and down. There's a whole industry ready to support you with props. And there are teachers out there who understand that you might need to, or I avoid the word need, it would be preferable to slow it down and focus on the inner game. So I throw out the word inner game for now before we move to another pearl because we'll address that and the pearl together. So let's look at another nuance of practice from Sage. We've explored feeling the breath moving in the body like a wave across time. The inhalations were followed by slightly longer exhalations in the service of down-regulating your nervous system. You can also, of course, feel the breath moving like a wave in your body, the actual movement of the shape change that happens with every breath. When you breathe in, of course, the air moves in and down, but the action in your body might feel like it's coming from the bottom up. So get still and feel what that feels like. Sometimes I like to envision myself resting on the beach and feel the breath lapping over me like a wave where the energy comes from the bottom up to the top and then it's matched by descent from the top back down to the bottom. It's useful to get to know your breath both across time and also across space so that you can tell where it gets hung up when it does get hung up. You have something to bring it back to, a good steady rhythm, both across space and across time. As you may have noticed, it's about an inner process where the breath is going, and that's one inner game. I'll ask Sage to elaborate a little bit more on that inner game, and then I'll come to the one that I was referring to. 
<laughs> it sounds to me like you're referring to Timothy Galway's Inner Game of Tennis, which is a classic of sports psychology, came out in maybe the late 70s or early 80s. And the philosophy there is that there's a self one and a self two. And it really is the, the process that we see in yoga about um, the thoughts that come through not being the actual self and remembering what the big self with the capital S is and not over identifying with the lowercase s little self that will have a chattering mind. And breath awareness is a really good way um, to stay connected to the bigger self, to get away from um, the fluctuations of the mind, the mental chatter that always is coming in and telling you stories about how you're breathing or how the game is going or how the race is going or um, whether you're a good parent or <laughs> whatever the, the chatter is that comes through. Um, when we can sit, be quiet, breathe, and observe, we see that that really is just some static passing through, and that is not uh, the truth of who you are. Yes, Sage, you got it just right. I was referring to that book. Actually, I think the book is even older mm. uh, because I believe someone won the U.S. Open or the Masters. Oh, I think it was the Masters in the 50s, and they were an avid yoga practitioner. Then they were successful and they stopped their yoga practice and then they were a one hit wonder. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an interesting perspective on how one could be very invested in a process, get tied to the result and then get corrupted by the result and lose the process. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the inner game especially for me as I've had diminished skills and uh, I'm more invested in the quality of the experience than whether I win. Of course, I love to win, uh, but I'm just not as emotionally tied because for me, I want to have pleasure and to play at my best, which has evolved to ping pong at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we can have balls of fury and, and, and just... <laughs> I can break a sweat playing ping pong too, not just by losing, but I actually won the other day and was sweating too. I love it. <laughs> so how would you suggest teachers uh, start to bring that inner game to their class? How could they change their languaging if necessary to invite students to let the result go? Um, the, these are the tools of dharana and dhyana, or as I like to call them, focus and presence. Uh, dharana, single point and concentration on something. Uh, in class, in class, I sometimes use drishti, uh, the gazing point, as a tool for developing focus because we're looking just at one thing, say in a standing balance pose or even in a seated posture, so that we don't encourage a bunch of distraction. Instead, we start to develop um, focus on one thing over time. Then dhyana is an awareness uh, across space uh, of, of many things at once. That's what I call presence. And when I say focus, I usually point forward. And when I say presence, I usually point to the sides. That's being able to be aware of many things simultaneously. So both of your breath and your body and of what you're gazing at and of other people in the room, uh, all simultaneously in one moment. When we can develop the tools of focus over time and presence over space, then uh, we can start to tap more into the truer nature of what's happening and less into the mental chatter. Hmm. That was a pretty significant chunk of perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's worth repeating a third time, potentially, because I'm still uh, digesting it myself. Uh, the tools, the tools of focus, uh, focus, the ability to sustain attention over time. Mm -hmm. And that's where gazing point is really useful. Mantra is another way that we learn to develop focus. And mantra is a really good way to, um, to quiet the fluctuation of the mind so that you can tap into your truer nature better. Um, because every time you find that the brain has wandered, you bring it back to the mm -hmm. mantra. And then once you've developed the ability to sustain focus, then you can start to develop a sense of presence, awareness of many things simultaneously. Mm. And for my athletes, both of these are important to different degrees, depending on the sport. If you are an endurance athlete, you need a lot of focus, the ability to sustain attention on your effort across time. 
Um, if you're a team sport athlete, you need a whole lot of presence because you need to be aware of where your teams, where your teammates are, where the ball is, where the goal is, what, how much time is left on the clock, whether you're winning or losing, you know, what the current score is. So the yoga practice can give you tools to develop these twin awarenesses, both mm. kind of forward over time and laterally uh, over space of a lot of things happening at once. Mm -hmm. And once you develop both of them, then you can really hit that meditative state where you, you're tuned into the now. Mm. So for me, I'm hearing that is a mental multitasking. Yet there's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's a both mono and multitasking kind of at the same time because um, you don't have to consciously deploy the senses to be in all of this. It, it happens almost um, simultaneously. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if when we're having this conversation right now, you and I are, are compelled to be staring at a uh, camera. <laughs> <laughs> We're listening to okay. each other, but we're not in the same room. Right. And and uh, for me, my gaze is fixed on a Nikon in front of me. And peripherally, <laughs> I could see you on some screens and hear you. Mm -hmm. And I think of that as how many of us, including myself, have been in Shavasana. And mm -hmm. that we're trying to focus on the breath, yet it's towards the end of class. There's a cycle coming up. And it could be very easy to review the class or review what's further. Uh, and when you have a mantra, as you suggested, is there one or several mantras that you like to incorporate? One that I like a lot in the context of a tougher workout or a race is, um, again, a reference to the third and fourth limbs of the Yoga Sutras, form and breath, form and breath, form and breath. And that reminds me to come to the most efficient form that I can find and to use the right breath for now. I also use some just like in, out, in, out. I do a lot of counting my steps. It, it depends on the situation. And then I have a few um, Sanskrit mantras that I kind of like to keep um, like keep behind glass in case of emergency and, and then tell myself, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to this one, that, that means I broke the glass, you know, oh. and it's going to give me some kind of superpower. I mean, in the course of a longer race, you have a lot of time to play these, these, uh, focus tricks on yourself. Mm -hmm. So what if someone was cooking a dish that had lots of ingredients, uh, take it out off the road and into the home? And it's an endurance activity, roughly an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Companies coming over. Uh, there's situations where that is lots of stuff happening and someone has to cook. How is cooking like running? Oh, that's a, that's a wonderful question. And my students would love to hear you ask me a question about food because I, I'm infamous, I think, for always finding a way to to create a food analogy out of something. Oh, so good. I love, I love it. <laughs> well, when you're cooking for your guests, I mean, it's, it's a lot like, yeah, like entering uh, a workout or a race or even a yoga practice where the number one thing is to be really clear on your intention and your goals. Mm -hmm. And for intention, I mean, like, what's the, what's the healing state? Um, what's the big picture? Why behind what you're doing? And it, <laughs> If you're having friends over for dinner, I think the intention is to show love to your friends. And if you can keep that um, top of mind, then you won't get so upset if you drop the tofurkey on the floor <laughs> or, or the things don't come out, the dish gets a little burnt or the ingredients don't mesh together quite right. If, if it's prepared with love um, and served with love, your friends will understand, appreciate that that's come through. So intention has to do with that, um, the feeling and then goals have to do with outcome. So your goal would be to have you know, the casserole out of the oven at 7.05 so it can set up and, and be on the table by 7.15 or whatever. Like the goals are external and tangible and measurable. And if you were setting out to prepare a dinner party, you'd want both. You'd want both the feeling states, the kind of internal, private, um, emotional impetus for why you're doing it. But also a sense of like, okay, now I need my goals. I need my shopping list. I'll go to the store. I'll get these ingredients. And you put them together um, to create this whole. And the same thing happens when you're going into a race. You have to have some connection to 
why are you doing it in the first place? And mm -hmm. what was the inner motivation? What's the intention? But then also, what are the benchmarks you want to hit along the way? What are the goals? And if you have both of them together, then you're able to um, hit any decision point with a lot more clarity because you can come back to your intention and your goals. And even more specifically in terms of running uh, or racing, uh, if it's something that's in your control, then your goals will help you make smart choices. Like for in the cooking analogy, in your control is what time you start the oven to bring it up to temperature. But if it's something that's out of your control, like you realized you didn't have a particular ingredient and now it's too late to go get it, the time is gone, or the weather is really weird and your souffle didn't rise properly, then you come back to your intention and your intention helps you meet it with the appropriate, um, with the appropriate fueling state. Mm. Delicious. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, now for a little aperitif, we're going to move towards another pearl offered by Sage to see if that will be our dessert for the <laughs> show. You may know that in order to create a physical change in your body, you have to apply some stress to your body. That means that if you want to get stronger, you actually have to lift some weights and push your limits in order to provoke your body to adapt to the change, to adapt and grow stronger for the next round. Consequently, we often get comfortable with the idea of discomfort because it's necessary for a productive change in our habits. Sometimes we get so comfortable with discomfort that we forget how to be comfortable with comfort. We forget how to be okay with everything just being okay. This can translate into an asana practice by continually holding tension or forcing ourselves far too deep into our poses. A lot of the work I do with athletes and just type A people in general is encouraging them to be comfortable with comfort, with not having to feel everything super strong all the time. I'm sure you have at least one person in your life that's high drama all the time. That seems exhausting. Let's see if we can develop better comfort with comfort so that we can have a proper balance of stress and rest in our lives. Comfort with comfort. That is layered. <laughs> Enjoy your dessert. Don't... It's, the, the comfort with discomfort comes so naturally to, to athletes. Uh, it's like my aunt puts a lot of really, uh, really spicy condiments on all of her food, and she'll put like half a, a shaker of um, hot pepper flakes on her food. <laughs> it's like she's so comfortable with the discomfort that she can't maybe tune into the subtleties of mm. having a dish that's just sweet. And it, does, it doesn't have to be high intensity all the time, nor can it, because of every meal that you have is covered in um, spicy, acidic sauce, it's going to wreak havoc on your digestion eventually. Yes, unless you were just born that way. Right. <laughs> so that's, that's an interesting factor. Uh, in essence, the philosophy of yoga can be that we're training for the discomfort to be with whatever comes up. And similarly for athletes, it appears that we're approaching the edge of discomfort uh, trying to break through into something else. Uh, but I think sometimes athletes can have a greater personal ego involved in that beyond just the path. They're really pushing in, and their discomfort can be uh, more ego-driven than the average person. How do, how do you temper their egos? Well, in the course of, a, of an asana class, I would give them a few opportunities to succeed, a few poses that um, play to their strengths, but then also some sense of humor poses and maybe a few poses that are designed for failure, that you're going to have to fall out of a particular balance pose. And mm -hmm. um, balance poses in particular are really good for teaching this lesson that if you over strive, if you try too hard, then you're going to develop too much rigidity around the shape and it will become unsustainable in the same way that you, that would happen if you didn't try enough. So you have to mm. find the, the appropriate balance. And um, once we've gotten some of the energy out, some of the wiggles out, then the work becomes to develop comfort with comfort and to be okay with just lying around on pillows, doing that lying around on the floor looks like nothing's happening yoga. That helps to um, downregulate the nervous system, to engage the parasympathetic, 
half of the nervous system to uh, invite the relaxation response because it's only in that state that your body is able to heal itself and recover from the stress that you put on it in your workouts. So if you're always only piling more on and putting more pepper flakes and more pepper flakes on your pasta, then you're never going to, to be able to, to quiet down and release that inflammation and grow stronger as a result. Mm. So it's another form of interval training and mindfulness and yeah. it all cues in. Mm -hmm. I was looking at your website and I was able to recognize some national leaders as well as some local folks who have been inspiring to you. Uh, one folk, one folk, one person, <laughs> one folk, two folk, red folk, blue folk, uh, <laughs> one person who we both are uh, familiar with who's local is Sonny Davis. Uh, I've had the pleasure to train under Sonny a little bit at Moving Mantra in Raleigh, and I saw that you had trained with Sonny also. Uh, how has Sonny uh, influenced you? Sonny was really integral in helping me see how yoga and um, cycling went together. She trained me in uh, to teach spin classes in the spinning mm. system, indoor cycling, and uh, and it's just a, a wonderful leader by example. Mm. Well, we want to send lots of love to Sunny, who's having a medical challenge and has been supportive to all of us in the community throughout the year. So, Sunny, we wish you great healing. Yes. Also, in another local plug, Sage has personally endeavored through her relationship with a local uh, academic <laughs> leader to advance our University of North Carolina in basketball. Uh, what tips do you give our Tar Heels and their leadership team for keeping their eye on the prize? Oh, it's, it's, it comes exactly back to comfort with comfort. And Howie, that's why you have me on Skype instead of <laughs> with you in the studio is that I, I had to go teach Coach Williams yoga this morning. And for, this is even more meta. In the middle of it, he had to sneak out to talk to the Mike and Mike radio show for seven minutes ah. right, right in the middle of practice. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, hey, tell yoga I put in a plug for yoga <laughs> on, <laughs> on national TV. <laughs> great. So, uh, yeah, it's great. But um, what I, I always say, yeah, do you have any special requests for practice this morning? And coach says, just, just make me feel better. And <laughs> that seems very wise. <laughs> because it, if you have a, a job as high stress as being the head coach of a Division One A basketball team, or um, really so many jobs are high stress, but that one in particular is almost never ending because when he's not um, in practice or going to games, he's working on recruiting and um, speaking to groups. I mean, it really is an unrelenting pace of work to carve out two hours in your week to just lie on the floor and breathe. It's really critical because you need, like we've been saying, to have that downtime so that you can grow stronger, so that you can recover, so that your body can heal itself, and so that your brain gets a time out, uh, so that your nervous system gets some rest, and so that you can tune into the big picture, to the intention and goals, really, mm. of, of why you're doing this job in the first place um, to serve the kids. Mm. Well, thank you. In review, we've had Sage Roundtree on, who has shared yoga for athletes, but life is an athletic endurance event. <laughs> Please consider viewers and listeners and teachers to contact Sage at Carborough Yoga Company. She's accessible via her website. She has trainings, videos, blogs, more information than you could possibly consume in one lifetime, but uh -huh. you don't need it all, just what works for you. Coming up on our show next week, we have Celia Hartnett, who is involved with yoga for 12-step recovery. Celia has been integral in the community in helping others heal and is involved in advancing the organization. Uh, we will be off the air on April 4th, so please practice yoga or view one of our other videos. Uh, we have Yoga Fest on April 8th here in Raleigh. And we hope that you will consider viewing in to our website, youcallthisyoga.org, for more information about that. We're appreciative of our sponsor, Neomond, where you can view 
the Neomon Minute at neomon.com under Explore. Thank you for viewing. Please feel free to view the show on the Nissan Communications On Demand header, and then you can scroll down to the You Call This Yoga area and just click and view. Sage has programs in Carborough and around the country. Thank you, Sage, for sharing your insights and passion. Thanks, Howie. It was fun. Namaste, Sage. And Namaste. everybody, we'll see you all next week, 930 with Celia Hartnett. Thank you. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section on nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by Atomos.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters, CarolinaApparel.com, and DeltaForce.net.